Welcome everybody. Uh, we are here today to launch uh, the book Philosophy of Psychology, which is here. Um, this book is published by Polity Press. And uh, uh, there are two authors. One is Kengo Miyazono, who is here with us. And, and the second author is myself, Lisa Bortolotti. And we are very lucky today because two experts are joining us to discuss some aspects of the book. Uh, in particular, we will look at chapter eight and chapter seven of the book today. Um, and what I want to do first is to ask uh, Kengo and our experts to briefly introduce themselves, uh, tell us what their main research interests are, so that we get to know them a little bit before the discussion. Kengo, do you want to start? Yes, uh, I'm Kengo Miyazono. I'm one of the authors of, of, of this book. Uh, I my research is uh, is is about philosophy of psychology. Uh, mainly, I have been working mainly on delusions and, and beliefs and cognitions, reasoning. Uh, yeah, that's that's what I do, and I'm very happy to to have a conversation with the commentators today. Fantastic. Katrina? I'm Katrina Sifford. I'm professor and chair of philosophy at Elmhurst University. That's in the United States in Illinois. My research focuses on criminal responsibility and excuse primarily, and I've done some work specifically on psychopathy. Fantastic. Pablo? Hi. Well, my, my name is Pablo Lobo Silva. Uh, I'm a professor of psychology. Originally, uh, a clinical psychologist, but more into philosophy of mind. I've been working on delusions, psychosis, and lately on neuroethics. Fantastic. So I'm Lisa Bortolotti. I'm professor of philosophy at the University of Birmingham, and I'm affiliated both with the philosophy department and the Institute for Mental Health in the School of Psychology. And my main interests are in the philosophy of the cognitive sciences, um, also some interest in the philosophy of psychiatry, both the ethical issues and the issues that have to do with the notion of, of disorder and what it is for something to be pathological. So as I was saying earlier, well, we're going to discuss chapter eight and chapter seven of the book, which are the chapters where we look at uh, some conditions that some people do consider as pathological um, symptoms of mental disorders, such as delusion and confabulation, and also autism and psychopathy and how they affect certain capacities that we have, cognitive capacities, but also capacity to exercise autonomy in a number of situations. So first, Katrina will give us a commentary, and we're really looking forward to hearing from her. Okay, um, I'm going to be focusing my comments on chapter eight of the book. Um, as Lisa indicated, this chapter covers autism and psychopathy. I really appreciated the book's nuanced view, sophisticated view of autism and psychopathy. Um, and the way they kind of the authors get this more nuanced view off the ground is by really exploring the nature of empathy, which is the um, something that has been thought to be lacking or um, um, problematic in both persons who have uh, psychopathy and autistics. Um, what the authors do is they go into some of the really more recent research exploring the nature of empathy. And they note that empathy really seems to involve at least two different components. So <clears throat> theory of mind is the cognitive process by which we attribute mental states to other people, um, desires, beliefs, so that we can understand and predict their behavior. That seems to be necessary to empathy, but also that in the moment sort of affective feeling, right? The affection or other sorts of feelings that we have towards other people, um, that also has been included within within empathy. And if we look at the two groups of people, um, people who are diagnosed as um, having psychopathy using the prominent diagnostic, the PCLR, and autistics, they have very different profiles with regard to empathy. It looks like persons with autism have problems with the ear of mind, but not necessarily affect. And persons with psychopathy, at least some of them, some subset of them have problems with affect, but not necessarily with theory of mind. In fact, this is why persons with psychopathy can be very kind of manipulative because they have maybe even in some cases heightened theory of mind. 
So when we parse apart what empathy really means, that we can start to understand the kind of differences between these two groups that in the literature as recently as 15 years ago were kind of lumped together. A little side note about um, psycho uh, psychopaths and uh, affect. It does look, and the authors note this very adeptly in the chapter, it does look like if you look really closely at the group psychopaths, only some small subset maybe even of them have flattened affect, which was thought to be a hallmark of, of um, psychopathy. Instead, some of them have kind of erratic affect or even exaggerated affect in kind of a negative direction. Um, so it's not entirely clear how affect works, works in psychopaths, but at least some of them experience the flattened affect that is thought to be the hallmark of psychopathy. And the authors move from there, from that more nuanced view of empathy, um, to, to explain that some really important features of autism and psychopathy are still not explained by focusing on deficits in empathy, even that nuanced view of empathy. So it looks like in autism, um, restricted rep repetitive behaviors are not well explained by deficits in theory of mind and impulsive reckless behavior, which is a hallmark of psychopathy is not explained by flattened affect or even erratic affect necessarily. Um, and I'll get into that in a, in a minute. I agree with all of these <laughs> Um, positions that are taken by the authors, I think that the work there is really well done. And what I'm going to do for my last couple of minutes is really push the line a little bit further with regard to some of their claims and say that some of those hallmarks of autism and psychopathy that do not seem well explained by lacks of empathy, even again, the nuanced understanding as theory of mind, deficits, and maybe even flattened affect can be maybe explained or that at least we should look in the direction of executive functioning as explaining those extra features of those um, two diagnoses. So um, I'll claim that deficits in executive function may explain some of those non-social features of autism and the antisocial behavior, the reckless, maybe impulsive behavior in psychopathy. Um, probably most people have some sense of what executive functions are, but just very quickly, they're those higher level reasoning capacities that tend to kind of be located here in the prefrontal cortex. Um, they also include volitional control. Some of the executive functions that people tend to agree upon are planning, working memory, top-down attention, inhibition, and task switching. Um, I think that focusing on executive functioning is not only important to explain these extra features of autism and psychopathy, but also because those capacities seem to be really, really important to moral agency and responsibility. And so if we focus on them, we can really get a better grip on whether um, autistics and persons with psychopathy have full agency in both the moral and the legal sense, or whether they might be eligible for excuse. Okay, so quickly, um, a little bit on executive functioning in autism. It looks like just a few quick, quick words about executive profiles. Everybody, even people who fall within the neurotypical category have very different executive profiles, right? So if you look at the, the list of things that's included within executive functioning, you will know yourself, you have some strengths in areas you know, you're a good multitasker, so you can do task switching, but you may have problems with working memory, right? That's not your strength. So across, there's a big spectrum of people with regard to their executive profiles. So I'm speaking in kind of generalities here with regard to the group of, of persons who are autistic. Um, but they do seem to have a profile where they have a need for sameness, they have difficulty in task switching, um, they have general difficulty initiating flexible non-routine actions, and you know, there's, there's a pro and a con to different sorts of executive profiles. The, da the downside of, of um, task not being able to do task switching, right, is that you can ignore certain features of the environment that might be important. But the upside is you might have heightened attentional focus, which can be a good thing in certain circumstances, OK? Um, children with autism do not show deficits, importantly, with inhibition and working memory tasks although they do show that difficulty with flexibility and planning. 
Um, and this executive profile needs to be seen against a particular sort of background with regard to moral agency. So high functioning autists participate in moral development, which usually happens through an attachment with caregivers, even if it is delayed in some cases. This process seems to enable them to identify and understand moral rules, right, to identify moral versus um, conventional transgressions, and they are concerned with others reactive attitudes. Right, they care if people get angry at them. They want to make people um, pleased with them. They feel like they're strongly a part of the moral community. So they answer to a societal audience, right, when they're acting. But in some cases, this societal audience seems more idealized instead of maybe in the moment actual. Because they have theory of mind deficits, they may have a hard time responding to reactive attitudes in that context in a particular circumstance, but they have a sense of an idealized societal audience that they have in mind when they're acting, right? So they have this kind of generalized moral concern, even though they show some differences in their kind of in the moment moral judgment. Uh, it seems that autistics use executive functions then to kind of focus oftentimes and show kind of heightened attentional focus on moral rules. They can build dispositions to act morally. They can monitor their behavior and inhibit immoral acts. And in this way, this is one of the reasons why I think we see that persons that are autistic tend to be good moral actors, right? They do not tend to commit crimes as a group, right? And Annalie Jefferson at Cardiff and I have been working on a paper that argues that it may be that some of the features of autism actually even lead to supererogatory moral agency and that their heightened attentional focus to moral rules means that they may be insensitive to social feedback that would kind of water down their moral action right? Um, if you're in a group of people and they're giving you peer pressure to do something that's actually not very moral, right? Then that societal feedback can act against your moral agency instead of supporting it. And because people, some people with autism may be less sensitive to that sort of feedback, they may, may have a heightened ability to act moral in certain circumstances. Okay. So very, very quickly, because I know I'm already over time, um, executive functions and psychopathy, the short um, story is that they're really mixed, right? It, it looks like the PCLR is diagnosing a group and labeling them psychopaths that are very mixed, heterogeneous with regard to both affect and executive function, okay? So it's hard to say anything generalized about executive function and psychopaths. The one thing I will say is it does look like at least some subset of psychopaths have um, intact executive functions, especially the ones that are labeled cool executive functions, that is ones that don't interact with height with emotional data. Okay, so on tests like the Wisconsin card sorting task, they seem to do pretty well, but on a gambling task where you're supposed to be using, using effective data, they have a harder time. Um, there's been, my colleague and I wrote a couple of papers on psychopathy and Georgieco and Malatesti have written a response arguing that it looks like these cool EFs really can be used in order to kind of correct for effective deficits that a psychopath may have. So they can, it looks like, and there's a bunch of data here in the, in the handout that you can probably see that I won't go through, but it looks like top-down attentional focus on kind of emotion cues that would indicate to a person that certain affect was being expressed right, can be used to kind of generate more moral behavior in psychopaths when they are directed to do so, okay, and on things like the gambling task. So heightened attentional focus top down can correct for these uh, effective deficits when the psychopath experiences them, which again, it's a, it's a mixed group. What's interesting is that that kind of general moral concern that I indicated that that autistics have seems to be lacking in many psychopaths. So while it's really mixed with regard to that in the moment sort of affect, whether psychopaths have flattened affect or heightened affect or whatever, that generalized moral concern that generally is generated by um, nor normal moral development seems to be missing in many psychopaths, okay? They're not motivated to do the right thing. And this is the kind of, this is the area I'm working on now. How does that work, right? Why do they not experience that, that need for, um, approval from society. They don't have that generalized moral concern. What does that mean with regard to psychopaths agency? 
I'm going to leave you here. What I think this means in general is that psychopaths may um, maybe not fully morally responsible because if they don't undergo the normal processes of moral development, even if they have regular executive functioning, if they have a complete lack of motivation to act morally because of that, that may affect their moral responsibility. But interestingly, from a legal perspective, it does not affect their legal responsibility. The law doesn't care how you feel. If you have the capacity to obey the law, it doesn't care that you don't want to. Okay, and that's what this quote from Oliver Wendell Holmes, who's a famous US, US jurist, says. So that may be a really interesting case of responsibility there, where there's maybe less moral responsibility, but still full legal responsibility. All right. Thank you so much, Katrina. That was brilliant in such a short time. So much information. <laughs> That's fantastic. So Kengo, do you want to have a go and make a comment? Or yeah, respond? yeah. Great. Thanks. Thanks a lot. I, I, so we didn't say much about executive function in the book. So uh, it's a it's a wonderful uh, addition to the information we already provided in the book. Uh, but we, we are aware that the executive function can be a very important factor, both in autism and in psychopathy. And then you have a uh, wonderful uh, ideas, uh, they all sound very plausible. So I have just one, I mean, I, so I have no disagreement, actually. I'm very interested in just following the, the kind of work you, you mentioned and you yourself too. But uh, I, let me ask just one question, uh, which is the, uh, which is about the relationship between the moral responsibility and and executive function. I totally agree that, that there is a strong connection between them, uh, between, between moral responsibility and executive function. But in, a, you, you, in your handout, I think you talked about a minimally working set of executive function for responsibility. And then I think I want to know a bit more about that. And then the question has two aspects. So one aspect is about the degree of executive function capacity that is minimal uh, for moral responsibility. So the, the degree question that, well, I think that will be a very difficult question, but I'm just curious. That's one aspect. And the other aspect is, uh, is, is the components, right? So you, talk, you talked about different uh, factors uh, constituting executive function. So you talked about planning, working memory, task switching, uh, and, and, and attention, uh, top-down attention. So which one is, is uh, which one is the most relevant or maybe all of them? Or so which one is the really, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just curious about that, that, how exactly the executive function is related to the, the moral responsibility, yeah. So I don't wanna hijack our discussion of your great book with too many details about the work that I'm doing, <laughs> but um, in general, we're looking, when we, we came up with the term minimal working set, right? Because we understand that everybody has different executive profiles. So people are gonna have different strengths mm. and weaknesses that are gonna balance each other out. So if you have you know, really strong uh, uh, task switching ability, but less working memory ability, they can work in tandem, especially with attentional focus um, to kind of produce good moral behavior and um, allow you to live a fulfilled life. But it's really important to understand those differences, right? Especially in the context of kind of thinking about neurotypicality versus neurodifference now. One of the things I'm interested in doing is really expanding out our understanding of what a normal set of kind of executive functions are. Um, with regard, I think this, I'm thinking now recently that attentional focus is really one of the most important ones because one of the really important things that executive functions can do is it can correct for um, mistakes and difference, like differences in perception, for example. So this is what you see with psychopaths, but like for the example I use with my students is if I suddenly saw like a big 
woolly bear in the classroom growling at me, I would think with my executive functions, I'm like something's gone wrong, right? Someone slipped me a drug. <laughs> I'm, I finally lost it due to my stress, whatever. And I would go see a doctor, right? And that's my executive functions, understanding that even if my eyes are really sure, right? If I'm really processing this visual stimuli, something has gone awry. And if we have that ability, that often can really help shore up our moral agency. Um, but of course, how to test for having a full suite of minimally working executive functions is super difficult. You need lots of different kinds of tests for hot and cold ones. And that's still a work in progress, right? That's a, you know, an aim we might have somewhere down the road, not something we can do now, unfortunately. Thanks. Thanks. So, so do you think that cool part of executive function is actually so because, you know, the, the attention stuff is belongs to the cool part or maybe not? I think that I I'm really still working on um, how the emotions interact with the executive functions and how, with how important that is. I actually think that one of the lessons mm -hmm. we get from autism and something you make really clear in the chapter is that this um, that in the moment affect may be less important to moral agency than we thought, but that there may be another way that background sort of mm -hmm. um, moral concern affect that is related to moral development that may be more important. So there's different ways in which emotion are important um, that I think need to be teased out. Fantastic. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Katrina and Kengo. So I think Pablo, uh, unless you have comments on this, I will let you talk about delusion which is a topic that we all care about a lot. <laughs> and we want to hear your take on what we do in the book with it. Sure, thank you. Uh, I'll share screen. All right, can you see me? Cool. Okay. Right, well, uh, first of all, I would like to thank Lisa and Kenga for this invitation. It's certainly an honor, a, good, a nice opportunity to talk to you. Um, I would like to make a brief, a very, very brief comment on the impact of this type of contribution to current issues within the specific, the specific fields of psychiatry and psychopathology. So as we have seen in philosophy of psychology, there is an invitation uh, for us to explore a very complex group of debates that arise when trying to look closer to mental phenomena, right? In doing so, Lisa and Kengo have been capable of creating a very pleasant uh, to read and a very precise book, the book. And in chapter seven, exactly, their analysis turns to unusual mental phenomena, right? Specifically to delusions and confabulations. So while delusions are defined as something like an untypical or non-paradigmatic uh, type of belief, confabulations are characterized as ill-granted claims made as, as the result of memory impairments. Both delusions and confabulations are not only philosophically important in their own right, but also they're important from a practical point of view, because at the end of the day, real people like us eh, are the ones who suffer from delusions. Real people like you and me eh, experience these confusing psychological consequences of confabulations. But here, let me ask a simple question. Why would we need, um, something like this. Why would we need a philosophical analysis of uh, this type of alter uh, mental phenomena? Or why would we need philosophers talking about this? In answering this, I think the relevance of, of the book uh, becomes even more significant. So let me focus on the case of delusions because it is the, is the debate I'm more familiar with. So, as it is clear from the book, delusions are very complex in terms of content, origin, and features. So there are delusions about others inserting thoughts into my mind, 
And the illusions about my body, for example, acquiring bizarre features such as an extra head or a metallic lip, right? So in this context, one of the most fundamental questions that psychiatrists and psychologists and philosophers ask when trying to understand delusional reports has to do with the type of mental state underlying these reports. And let me elaborate. If, we, if, if I tell my girlfriend, for example, that the coffee she just made is sweet, she might not have problems to assume that my report is based on a perceptual experience, right? The taste of the cup. If my girlfriend tells me that she was thinking about what would have been like to be part of the construction of the Notre Dame, the, the Notre Dame Cathedral, and believe me, she, she has thought about that because she loves that topic. <laughs> I wouldn't have a pro I wouldn't have much problems to assume that her report is based on a cognitive experience uh, of an imaginative type. So she was imagining that something like that. But what type of mental state underlies reports of people telling us that, for example, they are dead? or that their husbands have been replaced by aliens or imposters. So I, I have called this issue the typology problem of the issues, right? So in answering this uh, type of question, uh, one can become aware of, of the importance of, of, of this type of analysis. So as Lisa and Kengo suggest, this type of unusual mental phenomena provide new insight, insight to think about the human mind in ways that might not be possible by only looking to normal cases or uh, uh, neurotypical cases, right? In addition, answering typological questions might not only help to make conceptual progress in philosophy of mind and epistemology, but also empirical progress towards models that aim at clarifying the etiology of delusions in order to finally treat them, right? If we have a plausible view on the type of mental state delusions are, we might explore scientific mechan specific mechanisms, sorry, and structures of the brain in charge of the production of that specific type of mental state in order to understand what and how they go wrong in delusional cases. So in chapter seven, Lisa and Kengo spend a good amount of time arguing that delusions are best characterized as beliefs in what has been called the doxastic approach to delusions. So they do so by replying to two of the most popular arguments against this view. And with this, the book goes beyond the pursuit of pure theoretical progress and establish, establishes clear arguments for grounding empirical research on delusions, which is always good. So in addition, the authors also engage with discussions about the type of alterations that give rise to delusions and how delusional, delusional states, states would be irrational in a particular way. So here we can find a massive challenge for the academic community, a challenge that remains open. So Lisa and Kengo concludes that delusions do not seem to be irrational in a distinctive way. Right, uh, that is one of the, the things they they say, and that there might exist a continuity continuity between the so-called normal and abnormal conditions. So, uh, so here we can see something like this continuity. Uh, I made up some some of this uh, in between types of belief um, for didactic reasoning. However, if this is the case, how do we draw the line between beliefs that are irrational, abnormal, or even a little bit bizarre, but no delusion? Beyond our clear 
in my case, clinical intuitions, what is distinctive about delusions that makes them so dysfunctional? If delusions exist in this continuity with non-delusional beliefs, how do we account for the distinctive pathological nature of delusions? And finally, if delusions are beliefs or a type of belief, and it is an open question, the way in which they are distinctively irrational or inaccurate, what are beliefs after all? So I agree that the picture we have had of beliefs uh, until very recently, and actually delusions as well, for a long time has been over, over intellectualized. Right, I, I agree. However, we still need an answer for what makes delusions so distinctive and how they might exist on this continuity with non-delusional beliefs. So what can we conclude? Well, philosophy of psychology is not only a, an introduction, but also an open door that invites us to dive into this type of complex uh, issues. Philosophy of psychology is a two ways invitation. On the one hand, it is an invitation for people in the empirical sciences to get better grasp on, of some of the most fundamental conceptual issues underlying their professional practice. And on the other side, it is an invitation for philosophers to go beyond their own desk and engage with empirical data. So the complexity of mental phenomena really needs this type of bridges in order to make real progress. And I think philosophy and psychology is a good example of the way in which these bridges can be built. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pablo. This was fantastic. Uh, really, really nice. Uh, I think you perfectly get the spirit of, uh, of the book. That's exactly what we had in mind. We wanted you know, to, to open up discussions about complex phenomena to people who are mostly interested in the conceptual questions, but also to people who engage with empirical questions and create a, a space where they could talk to each other and, uh, and uh, also uh, try and collaborate in a kind of genuine way, where it's not the case that the philosophers get all the conceptual tasks and the empirical scientists get all the experimental work, but we actually kind of try and understand how the conceptual tasks are influenced by the empirical work and, and vice versa. So, um, so, so that, was, that was really good. Um, one thing that uh, you propose as a challenge for us, and I think it's a really, really good challenge, something that Kengo and I have been thinking about in our own work, is um, when you have a picture of delusions as continuous with, with other beliefs, um, how do you uh, make sense of the fact that there is something like delusion that is so distinctive? And you know, sometimes I talk to practitioners, to, to, to psychiatrists who encounter people with delusions in everyday life. And they tell me, you know, the person comes in, they open their mouth and I know, I know that's a delusion, right? So how is your philosophy of what delusion is? Explain that, you know, how, how do you account for that? There is a quality to what they say that immediately tells me that here I'm facing something unusual. I'm facing something interesting. Um, and you're absolutely right, you know, that a, a continuous account, a continuity account, like the one I propose, for instance, in my work, doesn't, doesn't answer that. Um, so let me just say one thing, and I'm sure Kengo wants to come in because this is, <laughs> is tough too. So, um, but one thing about it. So I guess my aim is not to suggest that there is no difference between irrational beliefs uh, of an everyday uh, quality and, and delusional beliefs that we find in, in the clinical environment. My idea has always been to challenge the thought that what makes delusions pathological, what makes delusions delusions, uh, has to do with the way in which they are irrational. So it's possible, for instance, to be able to 
actually explain to what extent delusions are irrational and to show that they are more irrational or irrational on a number of different dimensions than, than other beliefs that we all have. But what was important for me to try and get to the bottom of was the fact that still nowadays we don't have a theological definitions of delusions that have uh, reference to the way in which delusions are formed, although we have lots of complex theories about how delusions are formed that are very convincing. But we have definitions of delusions that rely on their epistemic features. So most of the time what we find in the psychological, psychiatric and philosophical literature is, you know, delusions are irrational beliefs where irrationality is defined in different ways, resistance to counter evidence or maybe not being supported by the evidence and so on. So my point was insofar as we define delusions as beliefs that are epistemically rational, we haven't distinguished them from other forms of irrational beliefs that we all have, such as optimistically biased beliefs about ourselves and our own performance. Why? Well, because those beliefs tick exactly the same boxes. They are resistant to counter evidence and feedback, and they are often formed without us having a lot of robust evidence in their favor. So um, what, where is it that they differentiate themselves? Because of course there are important differences. So one point could be, uh, you know, the effect that they have on our lives. So what people sometimes call the downstream effects. So thinking that I'm wonderful when I'm not will not do me any harm or, or anyway, if it does me harm, it's something kind of subtle and long-term uh, that has to do with how I, I expect things to go for me. Uh, but in general, it will increase my self-confidence and my success. Thinking that, uh, you know, people at work hate me and want to get me fired will not be very good for me, will make me feel anxious and stressed, will make me doubt everything I hear and I see, and will affect my performance at work and other aspects of my life. So there is a clear sense where downstream effects may uh, provide an initial way of distinguishing between epistemically rational beliefs that, uh, you know, may be okay, and actually sometimes even enhance my performance and epistemically rational beliefs that are going to disrupt my functioning. Um, there are also other things that I think matters to, to whether something is a delusion. Um, we don't get into a lot of details in the book, and it was just an initial uh, exploration. But it seems to me that very often for the person who has the delusion, the role that the delusion have for their identity is quite important. So the delusion may start as a mere observation about reality if it starts from an anomalous experience, for instance, but very often becomes very important to the person, to how they see themselves and, and becomes kind of almost defining of you know, their place in the world and so on. So that I think is something quite specific to delusions not just delusions in the clinical context, but also beliefs outside the clinical context that have many of the features of delusions. Um, so not only the fixity, which could be an epistemic feature, but also this sense that, you know, it tells us something important about how the person sees themselves or what the people, you know, how the person thinks that the world is engaging uh, all around with, with their own uh, agency and self-conception. So that's one kind of very uh, tentative initial response. I'm sure Ken got more to say. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, so let me. So I, I I agree with the Lisa's. I mean, we're not completely agree, but uh, there are some differences between us. But uh, I I really like that part. And then to that, I think I can add something which which is something I'm recently interested in. So, uh, which is that, um, so Pablo, you, you talk, so your challenge is about apparent distinctive feature of, of delusions. And then the question is how to make sense of the, the, these features. And then I think there are two ways of responding to the challenge. One is to take the apparent distinctive features at face value and try to explain that them and uh, the other option is to deny the apparent distinctive features but you can still 
explain the reason why people tend to think that they have distinctive features. So I think this, like I'm interested in this second option, um, which is, which take us, which will take us to the study of delusion attribution. So the, the, the way in which people attribute delusions with each other in our community. So, um, so maybe you are aware of Sam Wilkinson's recent paper on the expressivism about, about delusions. So he thinks that delusion attribution is expressive act, uh, expressing some kind of um, your, your reaction to, to, to the beliefs or something like that. So I'm not getting into the details of, of this, but uh, I'm just trying to suggest that uh, there could be a way to explain why people tend to take some particular beliefs to be distinctively uh, that, to be distinctive and then they're really different from others um, without really committed committed to the uh, to, to the idea that they are really different um, something like that yeah yeah I hope I hope that makes sense yeah yeah it does it does thank you Thank you so much, Pablo, for your comment today. Very, very interesting. And also, um, thank you for placing the book uh, exactly where I want it to be. Um, so the, the book has this kind of two parts, so several chapters that have to do with limitations of cognitions and agency that we find in everyday life. But then these last two chapters that really engage with kind of more unusual conditions. And um, that itself was kind of a... a not, uh, let's say, common choice for, for introduction to the philosophy of psychology. Some people want to see psychology more in the realm of the normal and, and the typical, right. and maybe a psychiatry or clinical psychology or abnormal psychology um, as, as discussing uh, what, what is not typical or not normal. But we really wanted to kind of to challenge that and, and to think of questions that can run across those two domains. And I think, uh, you know, your wonderful commentaries, Katrina and Pablo, really brought to life some of the work that is still there to be done. <laughs> so the book is just the beginning and then there is a lot more uh, complex questions that we need to be able to answer. But, um, you know, for now, thank you very much for uh, participating in the book launch of Philosophy of Psychology. I'm very grateful. Thank you for the invitation. Bye bye. Thank you so much for the invitation. I really appreciate it in engaging with the book. It's an excellent book. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye.